Okay. My goodness, Terry's got her friend here with us. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Yes, her master gardener. There you Yay. go. Is that's we got to start them young. That's absolutely the way to go. Okay, happy morning, everyone, and it, uh, thanks for joining us here. So, what uh, you know, what we're going to be doing here is uh, kicking off, um, you know, kicking off for February. Um, Tassie to give will be joining us here in a few minutes and it um, and I'm especially excited to see it to hear her presentation um, uh, uh, and she'll talk a little bit about who she is and where she come from but she's done some pretty exciting things in her career and it uh, so as it uh, it's we're going to be exciting here so I wanted to kick off with a slide that I actually shared last year at the uh, at their February meeting and I, and I thought the quotes were so uh, were so helpful here and yet it's, it seems that these, uh, the quotes seem to imply that February is rather bleak, but I got to admit, we're starting off with a lot of sunshine for February. So let's just, uh, as John and I were chatting before the meeting, let's not, um, let's not jinx it by talking too much about that sunshine, but uh, we're certainly enjoying it while we have it. Okay, so we kick off here today with it, uh, uh, our, standard, uh, 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 our standard agenda as we have it. I've got the uh, February to-dos from uh, OSU. And it, uh, we have a number of announcements and updates uh, before Tassie's presentation that'll come up um, here shortly, okay? So February, birthdays, quite a few actually for a short month, you know? So Sharon, who, who's on here today, happy birthday to you. And, it, uh, and uh, Jan, you're on with us here today. Happy yeah. birthday to you coming up. Happy birthday. And if, yeah, indeed. And of course that uh, Valentine's Day is coming up on the 14th and make sure that uh, none of us forget that for our special someones who need to be at uh, who need to be making note of that. Also, of course, we have a, a study group also on Valentine's Day, 1 p.m. And the Zoom was in the e-news, so it, um, uh, don't bother at um, you know trying to trying to write this one down. But it, uh, uh, but uh, next Monday at 1 p.m. An easy way to pick up a couple of hours of continuing education. So. On to who we are as a foundation and a reminder that we have our elected board here today, um, led by PJ and President-elect Sabine. And it, um, again, thanks for everybody who's, at, uh, who's, who's participating and stepping forward as an officer uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the board here in 2022. Of course, we have Alina and Brenda representing us as coordinators and Tony, our faculty liaison. And it, um, just a quick reminder for everybody here is that as we're getting into the year with all the activities that we've got going on, John, Margie, Terry, and Cindy can all value your contributions uh, for volunteering. So it, uh, this is a training year, as you know, we've got a home and garden show and a garden tour underway. We've got demonstration gardens. Uh, Margie's got a lot of stuff happening in terms of hospitality and program support. And it, um, so there's lots of places to contribute and that uh, make your uh, presence known here. So February, tune up the lawnmower, test your soil, plan a herb bed, plan your flowering landscape. And it, uh, interesting thoughts here about native flower seed mixes, right? Especially to attract and retain pollen, uh, you know, uh, pollinators. Um, I've actually found too, by the way, just by having native flower, native flowering seed beds, it's been a great way to consume a lot of garden, a lot of lawn area that would otherwise have to be mowed and tended. Um, and so I've just got them sown with wild flowers that um, uh, to make for a very nice uh, um, uh, covering for a good part of it. Um, reminder that uh, both OSU and WSU have um, uh, soil lab uh, recommendations for use um, and uh, so both of the, uh, the, uh, the OSU recommendation is actually more attuned to home gardeners. Uh, the WSU recommendation actually is aimed more at farmers and large acreages. Um, but, um, but again, that, um, uh, there's the, uh, these are the you know, uh, recommended labs. So maintenance and cleanup. Uh, winter damage. I've certainly had a lot of pruning and a lot of it, um, you know, a lot of uh, cleaning up around it, um, uh, around the, uh, in the foliage. Um, interesting about fertilizing the rhubarb here and it, um, and uh, turning over the cover crops, time to, to uh, um, time to get the soil ready, ready to play 
Um, and then at uh, cold frames or hotbeds, start early vegetables. We had some people down here talking about their peas are already starting to come up. So at, um, you know, at, uh, they're especially hopeful. To do's, of course, in terms of pest monitoring. Um, this is, of course, a time of year at which we're still looking at a lot of winter damage on, uh, on trees. And it, um, uh, it may, you know, some of that damage that um, may work itself out, right, as, a, as the, you know, as the, as the growing season comes in. Other times, you know, it, uh, this is a, indeed a, a time to get after it and, it, um, and uh, either remove, you know, a diseased limb or, it, um, you know, as you're seeing here, you know, it, um, as you're seeing here, take close attention and, it, uh, you know, do, do as much repair work as you can. Um, you know, we don't emphasize this enough about sterilizing tools, do we, right? Is that, uh, is that uh, you know, if indeed, if indeed we're cutting with a tool and we pick up microscopic uh, um, uh, pest or uh, their bacteria on our tools, uh, we certainly don't want to be spreading that throughout an orchard or throughout the, uh, throughout the rest of the landscape. Planning. And indeed, what uh, OSU is talking about, you know, it's time to start get, get start thinking about these things, especially indoor work. Um, I mean, reaching out to everybody on the call here this morning, um, you know, who's do we have indoor stuff going on? Have you have you got some seed flats working? Um, at the at the demonstration garden, we have a, a bunch of uh, seeds on the heat mat ready. Well. Because we're planning for the the not the plant planet, what is it the uh, the food bank uh, seedlings that we usually that we've done in the past we're planning the same thing kind of thing this year so we start early I don't have my headphones I can't listen to it without <laughs> Cindy, so it I hear that the milk jug bottles are doing very well too yeah we. Had, yes, almost a hundred of them, but but the, not all of them have uh, seedlings uh, emerging yet. But we uh, we have, oh gosh, at least a couple of trays. Well, it's two and a half trays of of seedlings that we've transplanted from the lettuce, and then also uh, there were several uh, containers of radishes, which you know we could we can't leave the radishes in the milk jugs. So I just transplanted them into some straw bale um, beds that we have. So, 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 so that's, those are the things that we've worked on so far. But I was going to ask also, Cindy, about, so the, the milk jugs are, you, you are seeing some signs of life, right? It's, and oh, yeah. those are outside, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, the, yeah, the, yeah, they sat through some pretty darn cold weather uh, we had. Uh, and the lettuce, well, you probably know this, I feel like this is every year is a brand new year. Um, and a good learning experience. But, but the real, the real, uh, star of the show is the lettuce is, is really germinating wildly so well congratulations oh, okay. so, that's for sure yes yes excuse me i'm sorry it sounds like you's on the phone so hold on a second so <laughs> who else has things going on who else has the uh, starts going on inside well I imagine certainly when we get to next month, there will be quite a bit more activity going on here. But again, even as OSU is recommending, hey, it's time to you know it's time to put in your peas, you know, with the, if you indeed have workable soil. Um, reminder, quick also by the way that uh, we also have um, you know that um, WSU has a, um, a a weather site that actually has soil temperatures at various locations, including uh, uh, Grayland, Montesano and at uh, Long Beach. So if indeed you don't have a soil thermometer, you certainly can be checking on soil temperatures. Um, I just looked by the way, and it, uh, it's still in the forties way down here. So, it, uh, so we've got a long ways to go before soil temps get up to where any, any optimum uh, germination level. Okay, coming up to announcements. I know we have a bunch of stuff going on and, it, um, and so I'm gonna open this things up to a uh, various announcement. Um, one of the first things that uh, I wanted to kick off to is a reminder to everybody, and this is coming from, uh, from Margie and from, um, and from uh, Chris, is that when we've got meetings, when you've got activities, when you've got announcements you want to make to the group, make sure you're thinking ahead as to when they can be published, right? The e-news comes out, right, first of the month. 
Um, the website, Chris is requesting at least three weeks, right, to be able to get materials posted onto the calendar on the website. And of course, uh, um, Katie and John will appreciate as much lead time as possible for any email blast to the memberships, if indeed there's stuff to be happening. So uh, there's just a, a shout out as we get into this time of busyness in terms of going on with a, a, a bunch of activities. Um, let's be thinking ahead about the calendar time so that the people that can post and get our information out have adequate, uh, had ad adequate lead times. Can I also add, Kelly, that on the other end, <laughs> we still have people that are working. And so they're, they need to know to get support hours, support program hours, you know, when are the plant clinics coming up? Um, when are other events coming up uh, that weren't in the e-news or uh, because they want to plan ahead. Okay, this Saturday I'm going to do plant clinic and next Sunday I'm going to do something else. So it not only helps Chris and um, everybody and Karen and other people to post, but it also helps our members to find out what's going on. And Cindy does a great job of putting in an e-news, but I don't see a whole lot of that going on in the other three gardens, so, or areas of our counties. So that's just the other side of it. Yep. So indeed, if we want volunteers to, at uh, activity, we've got to let them know and we've got to give them time to make it happen. So it uh, makes sense. Thanks, Alina. That brings a good point about uh, where are we as far as coronavirus goes. I got a mixed uh, uh, announcements from Washington State University saying that uh, you got to wear masks and in out in the public at all times but then somebody else told me in the our, our group that you don't have to wear them anymore that's not true alina okay. brenda any any update on this any official update okay oops the uh official update was in the e-news directly from mike gaffney um that basically said uh you have to wear masks indoors, whether you're vaccinated or not, obviously. They recommend a KN95 or a N95, but it's not required. Um, if you're in an outdoor setting where you're, where there's lots of people like the home and garden show or the, the tour, garden tour, Master gardeners have to wear masks, even though it's outside, because we don't know who is vaccinated and who is not. Um, for training purposes, we need, everyone needs to wear a mask when indoors, and we will not be serving beverages or snacks or food. People have to bring their own and they have to eat them outdoors where they can take their masks off. So it's probably what you heard, John, is a little bit of both, but not all of both. Thank you. But you're saying, Alina, the details are in this latest e-news? Yes. OK. Very good. Pertinent, pertinent to our members. The news about, about the training has already been shared with the trainees. Very good. And speaking of training, you know, is it, um, I'll turn it over to Cindy here for any comments she wants to make here, but um, orientation coming up on February 19th. So how many folks do we have, Cindy? And it, uh, what's, the, it, uh, what's the plan? How's it going? Well, uh, so the orientation is, is predominantly uh, planned by the coordinators. And actually, uh, Brenda and Elena are also the people that will know the actual numbers. I, yeah, I'm passing the buck here. Um, but but the reality is that they are the, the folks in the know on the actual numbers too. We don't get, we, on the training committee, we get the information from Elena and Brenda. So you might as well hear from them directly. I think, well, Brenda, you want to speak to that about how many people we have? That yes. have yeah, I sure uh, will. Um, we had 25 
apply. So of those 25, we have 21 applicants that have completed their VAX verification, the meet and greet, and they are now in the process of registering them. And many of them have registered already. The other four are still uh, in some kind of process. They, they're not really responding. Uh, they have not done a background check and or the VAX verification. So uh, they don't have too long left to get going before they will miss the cutoff. So we, but we have 21 for sure. And, and, and can you explain the cutoff to Brenda? Well, I mean, if they haven't registered and taken care of all of these other tasks before orientation, it's, it's gonna be too late because they're holding up the rest of the class. Uh, mm -hmm. The rest of the applicants cannot get their flash drives until everybody has registered with WSU on that part, from what I understand. Thanks. Perfect, thank you. So again, the training schedule is being is posted here, what you're looking at here, and it, um, you know, the training officially begins on the 5th, right? So it, um, and it's, uh, it's amazing how quickly that's going to come. <laughs> so I think it is, I appreciate Brenda and Alina, how imperative it is to get these last four finished out and to get everybody's thumb drives out there so that we can get, uh, you know, make it happen to uh, orientation and then proceed on. Okay. Cindy, any other comments and that, uh, any other outreach or appeal to, uh, to, to members for support or encouragement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah thanks, Kelly. That's a really good point. Uh, is that is uh, the, the teams are a, a little bit smaller than they have been in the past. I think it's just a matter of, of uh, COVID kind of pruning, <laughs> pruning how many people are interested in working with us out. And if, so we, so I, I would say for the botany session, we could use a couple more hands on, on deck. Uh, and th that would include helping with presentations. Uh, you don't have to make them up. We already have the, the presentations ready to go. So I am just sending out a, an invitation to our Master Gardener membership here if they want to participate in training. Um, yeah, let's we'll start with botany. We have a, a, it'll be a fun session. We'll be spending half the day out in the, in the demonstration garden. Hey, nice guy in your picture there, Kelly. <laughs> We're getting the best angle. <laughs> the other thing is I wanted to make sure that, that uh, folks uh, knew that we, we think that training is also a good place for veterans and new master gardeners to get uh, some co uh, con continuing education and that we'd like to have our doors open to you guys. Uh, but we also have, we'll have some, a couple of rules of the road if you do decide to join us at a training session. And, and primarily we're, we're looking for no talking um, and, but you have to wear a mask like everybody else. And, um, but we can, we can discuss that if, at a later date, I think, um, but we would welcome veterans to our sessions for the most part, with the exception of mm -hmm. Karen Golightly's session, which is uh, plant diagnostics on May 7th. And I would say not, unless you, unless you get a different message from Sharon Coolish Bales on May the 25th, 20, 21st, excuse me, because we have some fairly small venues. They don't seat too many people, but we have a big, huge um, dog barn uh, for most of the other sessions. So, so there's, there should be plenty of room for people to self distance. Oh my gosh. <laughs> anyways, so anyways, so that's, I think that's about all you need to hear from me on that. Cindy, yes, would you prefer that people let you know ahead of time if they're going to attend, I'm talking about vets, if they're going to attend a session just to get CE? Um, you know, I, I don't know how to organize that, Sharon. It sounds like I'd have to track too much information. So I'd say just show up, but wear your badge and bring your mask and be prepared to walk outside if you need to get a drink of water you know, that kind of stuff. So the same COVID rules that the rest of us are going to have to apply. It, it applies to everybody. And then also we'll ask that the folks just not have side conversations. So yes. Yeah, Sharon. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to comment. I already have a couple of volunteers, but uh, 
The afternoon session is when I need volunteers from 1230 on. And I already have a, a couple, as I said, uh, but it's in the extension uh, classroom and the annex and uh, we need it for the pretend clinics, about 10 people. Uh, I'd like to volunteer, Sharon. This is Karen. Okay. I'm not showing my face. My hair looks messy, but. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. <laughs> but I would be happy to volunteer for the phony plant clinic. Who is that? It's, it was, it's still Karen. It was still Karen, oh, okay. yeah. And, and it's a fun thing to do, so you should should yeah. give it a try. Okay, it's very Great. fun. Thank you. Sharon, I'll volunteer to. Uh, okay, Valerie. Thank you. You send an email to me. Contact me via email. Thank you. Sharon, do you send an email to me? And uh, I think I responded back saying yes. I would uh, be more than happy to. Great, John. You be you be great. <laughs> Yeah, we need to have John's got to be there to be the gruff, you know, the, the right. gruff and, you know, at, uh, you know, at, uh, assertive, you know, I'll bring some exotic plants. Yeah. That's oh, good. yeah. <laughs> I can count on you for that. Yeah. Yeah. We're looking. So how's your list going? Plants. I have about, um, I have about five. Of course, you can count on me for whatever, Sharon, you know that. Okay, so. June. Sharon, Sharon, I will do it too. This is Connie. Okay. Hey, Connie. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Anything else on training? The calendar is up here now. Obviously, at the this is the time of year at which is the time at which it um if if you have general questions, of course, you know, Cindy, Alina, and Brenda can be there from an oversight standpoint. But this is the time to reach out to the individual leaders of each session. If indeed, and I think just backing up on what we're sharing, we were talking about earlier, if indeed you want to attend for CE credit, perhaps just let the leader know, let the let the coordinator know that you're you're coming and that uh, so that they can expect you, you know, and, it, uh, and make sure that materials are there for you and so forth. Yeah. And, you know, Kelly, so we, we are going to have some uh, some fabulous Washington State University presenters. So um, uh, so. We, we will advertise that so that people know and about the time that that, that that person is going to speak and at what session so that they can come just to hear that. For instance, um, uh, Jamie Quigg, who does entomology for us, has, has invited Todd Murray, who will talk on beneficial insects. And if you, you know, oh, that's a that's a tough one for any of us to miss if we if we are excited about, you know, pollinators or whatever. So that you might want to put that one on your calendar. Um, but I will, I will let you know. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I got to stop my brain from spinning. And, and as soon as that happens, I'll let, I'll let everybody know what sessions uh, people have special um, speakers and, and have room for people to, to come um, and, and be there. So, excuse me. So. That'll be great. Thanks in advance for that. Okay, and thanks for everybody in for stepping up for this training. It's obviously it's a big part, you know, these are 21 people, hopefully 25 that, uh, you know, will be welcoming into the new fold here. And it, um, 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 they value, of course, as you know, right, they value being welcomed and they value the social network and the connections that we establish as Master Gardeners, as a community here. So, it, um, you know, so it, um, I look forward to all of you participating um, and, it, uh, and engaging as we, get fo as we go forward. So, um, uh, PJ, I know you've been leading the committee. You've got a committee a meeting coming up um, th this week, right? Uh, you know, regarding it uh, kicking off an update um, to the bylaws. Any update you want to share to the group? Just that um, the first meeting will be this Friday at 2.30. Gary Fredericks is mentoring us and guiding us. Callet's just finished their update and actually had an expert, as I understand it, on the committee who does bylaws for sort of a living. So they're all together. And while they're a different organization than we are, as Gary well knows, um, 
he will guide us through, make sure we haven't missed anything so that when we get this first draft done and get it in front of the membership, that everybody will have something that they can edit and know that we haven't missed anything we absolutely have to have uh, for Washington and for us. And um, the committee has a link to the new Washington State updates for 5013C bylaws. Thanks to Melinda for that. And we have copies of the Cowlitz bylaws and we have our bylaws. So we're ready to go. 2.30 Zoom with Gary. And he set everything up on his Zoom, which is very useful. Sabine? Yeah, uh, PJ, we have not received a Zoom link yet, or at least I didn't see one. Will Gary send one out to us? He did send one out, Sabine, probably about three weeks ago. But I, I think, be, no, I don't think I gave him your email because oh. you weren't necessarily on the committee. I will get the link to you. I appreciate it because worry. you know I wanted to sit in and get the scoop. Thank you. So uh, PJ is still looking for anybody, Any could, could others join in the committee if indeed they wish? Um, they can, I don't, I, I would like to know that because committees when they get large and we're just in the drafting part or in the editing part that I just need to know that and we need to let sure. Gary know because as I said, he's running the Zoom. So I have to get that information to him. So I had said that the last time if, someone's been missed and they want to participate just let me know and i'll get them your email very good and so it um by the way thanks um uh for everybody who's participating in this effort and it um and importantly um uh i my encouragement for you to participate and stay engaged is that i find that many nonprofits that are in the local area right um uh suffer from poor governance. And it's not because of lack of intention, but it's just lack of structure, lack of knowledge. So this as a as an opportunity to learn more about bylaws and about nonprofit governance could be an excellent experience, not just obviously for our benefit here as Master Gardeners, but for any other nonprofits that you may be associated with. So I encourage you to stay in tune with this. And I want to thank uh, thanks in advance, you know, to PJ and all the team members in terms of looking after this, because um, uh, these bylaws do um, do need attention. They need love. And also to Gary for reaching out and, you know, a sister uh, foundation person who has been so willing to uh, work with us. And that's been exciting, too. Uh, can I ask what is Gary's last name so I can look for it on my email? Fredericks. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sharon, if you don't have it, let me know. All right. Yeah, Gary Fredericks is a longtime WSU um, coordinator out of, at, um, out of Longview. Thank you. Great support of the program. Okay, so for those of you on the board, we voted and approved our 2022 fiscal budget last month. So what you see here for everybody's uh, uh, digestion here is that we do have a budget plan for this year. This is our approved budget. Um, there are details in here that we can provide if there's any particular questions, but overall, we're looking to spend more than we take in uh, this year. And it, um, it's still because it's just, um, this is a, you know, it's an iffy year given that we're hopefully moving out of COVID and it uh, hopefully proceeding ahead with a very strong home and garden show. Um, but it, uh, but indeed, we're projecting a loss of nearly six thousand dollars, which we can easily absorb, mind you, based upon our cash right. reserves of uh, nearly sixty thousand dollars. So it uh, will be able to move through uh, this year well. Sharon, you want to comment? Yeah, I do. Uh, Terry sent out a message the other day that we received the grant. I can't remember exactly what it is for, so that will reduce our loss. Very good. That's correct. Yay. In fact, Terry, that's the grant from the, uh, the Grays Harbor Tourism. I think Terry's, a, Terry's attending to her a babysitting responsibility, but yeah, that's correct. So I think that's nearly $3,000, um, if not over $3,000 from the Grays Harbor Tourism, which by the way, make, make note of that, that recognizes that what we do for the Home and Garden Show is an economic development activity for the county. 
So I assure you, all of our effort in contributing to that actually brings benefit, business benefit, economic benefit to the counties. So it, um, you know, that's a great, um, it's a great win to have that grant amount. But indeed, it's recognition that the work we do, the show that we put on, um, you know, it helps drive economic activity um, in the counties. So the other note I want to make on here, mind you, is that that plant sales. Remember those plant sale activity, those are indeed, um, uh, uh, they have to, now is the time to be thinking about what plants you want to start or set aside or separate to be ready for sale in July at the garden tour. It's a very successful program. People are eager to open their wallets and spend some money and buy some plants. Um, so it's, it's, I would hope that everyone is planning two or three dozen starts of, um, of something that would be appealing and compelling for possible uh, uh, buyers, you know, come July. So budgets approved. Our scholarship is also underway. Also, yes. as you've seen from the announcement that Katie just pushed out um, just the other day. So again, that uh, Trish is leading this effort. Once again, we've got a thousand dollars here that's uh, set. The application is up on the website. Um, you know, we're looking for a graduating senior. This includes uh, homeschoolers or alternative schoolers uh, throughout both counties. If there's any questions, reach out to Trish. This is a great vehicle, mind you, as, as we know, a great vehicle to get word out about our program and to uh, make sure that the community understands that who we are and what we're all about. So from just a visibility benefit to the program, the scholarship activity and the scholarship committee that uh, Trish leads is of great benefit. So hats off to Trish and the team in starting with that. Could this also be a scholarship for forestry since a lot of our discussion and presentations have been around forestry? I can answer that, yes. Good. Very good. So Home and Garden Show, speaking up uh, as we get into this thing, as it, uh, just, to, just to pick up on that, that's the 14th and the 15th is the actual show. We will do set up on the 12th and the 13th of May. So please do set your calendars now to, uh, to those dates uh, because uh, we really do need all hands on deck to help prepare. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a major event. Um, my understanding is that, um, and that, um, uh, Terry, Robin, uh, or Rhonda, if, if you're on, any of you are on, um, we're already getting good response from vendors who are eager to, uh, to, to have to, to, come, uh, to come and join us with us this year. Yeah, this is Robin. I don't know if you can see me. I'm on my telephone, but um, uh, my telephone, that shows how old I am. I'm on my <laughs> telephone. <laughs> Any, anyway, um, yeah, we are getting good response. I have 25 for the garden side signed up now. And um, the home side is always a little slower because those big, the big box people, they're not, you know, I don't know. They have to go through all these different chains and stuff before they really get their stuff together. But anyway, so, but we're still looking for more. Um, so I've had a few people reach out and give me, a, give me some vendor ideas and I've contacted them and uh, it's been good. So yeah, it's coming, it's coming along good. Terry is actually in Seattle getting babysitting her little granddaughter right now. So she said she might not be able to get on this call, maybe, but she will be on the board meeting later. Just so Very you know. good. Any other questions yeah. for Robin, you know, regarding the home and garden show? Again, put it on your calendar because it does uh, a lot of planning and, and work up. And of course, those of you who've been, it's just, it's a fun show, of course, right? You know, and so it, um, it's a fun show and it's a lot, it's a lot of work and a lot of walking and a lot of, I, I, um, I don't know, just so you know, I do have scoliosis and I have been diagnosed with it about five, six years ago now, and it's getting pretty bad and I'm trying my best to do everything I can to slow it down. But, um, I, I was thinking the other day, it's been two years since I've been to the home and garden show because we had a council for two years. Uh, three years ago when I went, I was still walking around pretty good and I had pain, but it wasn't, but this year I'm really going to need help. I'm really going to need runners, you know, people, because walking on that hard floor really hurts. And um, 
anyway, I always have to walk. I, I must put in 30,000 miles in a weekend <laughs> walking yeah. around that arena. Yeah. And so I, I will, I will need people to help just like, where do you want me to go? Like, can you run this over to this vendor or can you, you know, yeah. just kind of, it's going to be a little bit harder. So once again, all hands on deck, that's for sure. Yes, yes. To that end, make sure you're recording your hours. You know, it, um, this is at, uh, you know, the Give Pulse sy uh, system is there. Um, Eileen, uh, Alina, uh, Brenda, uh, uh, are we doing a good job of getting at, um, activities in already? Are, are, are you seeing it, uh, a, good, a good discipline, good hygiene on behalf of our gardeners here of entering, our, of entering the of beginning, of beginning the year better. with the proper entry of hours? Yes, we are getting people that are logging in their hours and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Obviously, still any questions on Give Pulse, reach out to Brenda and or Alina and we'll take it from there. So another quick heads up, by the way, another great opportunity for continuing education hours is SoilCon. Wow. And, and so, yeah, this is a WS, this is the second year they've done this online. Um, just hit, just do a search for WSU SoilCon and check out the speakers. Um, it's, there are, there's just a whole series of speakers from across the country that are, uh, are, consult, are, are speaking on this. And it, um, you know, I attended a number of these sessions last year, was very impressed and hugely encourage you to, uh, to step up, you know, engage, um, and engage. So again, an easy opportunity for cont continuing education with some sessions that I know are gonna be impressive. So with that, I wanna introduce Tassie. I believe you're, I, I think you're online. Yes, I'm here. There you are, that's yeah. for sure. So I wanna thank you for joining us here. And it, uh, you know, I'll, I wanna, uh, I'll stop sharing and give you the screen share at, uh, responsibilities. And while I'm doing that, indeed, uh, you know, could you just go ahead and just, you know, introduce it, uh, you know, just introduce it, uh, it uh, yourself, you know, and give a chance to talk about who you are and your background, because I was fascinated, by the way, for what you've done, what you've accomplished, thrilled that you're back here in the Northwest, right? Yeah. And it, uh, and very much looking forward to what you have to share with us today. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Tassie Dejeev. And I, um, yeah, I am an instructor. I teach horticulture at the UW Botanic Gardens. I also teach at the Volunteer Park Conservatory um, and the Bellevue Botanic Gardens as well. Um, I have a couple different shops. I just opened another shop um, in New York City called Geometry Gardens. And then I'm the plant director for a shop here in Seattle called Glasswing Greenhouse. Um, I'm working on my second book um, that is gonna be more about the like different philosophies in plant care. I'm gonna be interviewing some gardeners, botanists, different people to talk about how they take care of their own plants um, and advice they have for other people. And yeah, just running around doing plant things all the time. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about indoor plants and the care because I know, you know, as master gardeners, you're primarily focused on outdoor plants. And there is, of course, a lot of overlap, um, but I'll just be going through how, you know, the lighting and the watering changes when we're when we're talking about indoor plants. So let me see, let me try to share my screen. It said host disabled screen sharing. Oh, my, there you go. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. My apologies. Oh, no worries. All right, can you all see that okay? We've Let got it. Bigger, okay. So I usually start um, just talking about when the idea of an indoor plant began, and it was really in the Victorian era. Um, in, you know, in the 1800s, the invention of glass as used in homes became readily available, and it allowed not only light to pass, but also, you know, temperature control. Um, and those are really the things needed for indoor plants. 
Um, around the Victorian era, there were also Europeans who traveled to more tropical climates and brought plants back to Europe and had to figure out how to keep these types of plants alive in a you know, European environment where you have pretty harsh winters and things like that. So it's really when they started to develop you know, the glass and the conservatories that the idea of indoor plants as we know it today developed. And, you know, what is not an indoor plant? You know, plants that require seasonal um, changes, plants that need to go through dormancy um, in the winter. Um, a lot of times people try to bring hydrangeas and roses inside and they just really don't work as an indoor plant because they need the change in temperature primarily at night in order to continue to live. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but plants, you know, indoor, all plants really, but indoor plants too, they need a kind of warmer daytime temperature, slightly cooler nighttime temperature. Um, but these plants need it more drastically. They need it to really cool off at night. Um, and then, you know, perennial plants are not really meant to keep going forever. They kind of have a life cycle. So they grow out, they flower or fruit, you know, some of them like annuals form a seed um, and then they die off. That's just the normal life cycle of the plant. Um, and some plants, you know, some annuals can be brought indoors um, and still go through a little bit of a dormancy, but for the most part, it's we're talking about tropical plants as indoor plants, plants that are used to being around the 60 to 80 degree temperature range year round. I always recommend trying to find the, you know, genus or species name of a plant. So either, you know, going to a garden center, a horticulture society, Googling the plant, like purple striped plant and seeing what comes up. Because once you kind of know the basic classification of the plant, then you can kind of group things together. Like all philodendrons are roughly gonna want the same care. All dracaenas are gonna want the same care. Um, things like that. And then I also recommend once you have the name of the plant, doing a little bit of research to learn about its natural environment. You know, a lot of the tropical plants are from more kind of montane cloud forest regions or from very arid desert regions. And so once you kind of understand how it lives in nature, you can try to somewhat replicate that in your own home environment. But you can see the top left image where this plant gets kind of like filtered natural light. You know, it has a view of the sky. That's really important for indoor plants. And we're, we're gonna talk a lot about lighting and how that affects indoor plants. So just do a little bit of research, you know, you're never going to be able to replicate the, the indoor environment exactly, nor should you, <laughs> but, um, but it is helpful in understanding where the plant is native to and, and kind of what kind of conditions it's usually exposed to. And then just as any outdoor plant, the same process of photosynthesis takes place and also respiration um, at night. So again, having darkness at night, having it be a little bit cooler temperature is going to really help the plant um, complete its process of photosynthesis and respiration. Sometimes I find, you know, when clients contact me about their plants that are struggling, sometimes we kind of realize it's because they have a light, they're, they've, they're leaving their grow lights on all the time, like 24 hours a day <laughs> almost, and the plant is stressed out. It's trying to photosynthesize, but it never gets to complete the process um, at, in, you know, in the dark. So it, it's not healthy for a plant to be exposed to light 24 hours a day. It definitely needs a resting period as well. So this is um, Daryl Chang. He has a popular, um, blog and Instagram and website called Houseplant Journal. And if you don't know who this is, I would highly recommend checking out his site. He is an engineer by trade, but he's done a lot of experiments and um, a lot of analysis on lighting and indoor plants. 
And I put him in here because I really like the way he talks about indoor plant lighting. It's very straightforward. He says, give your plant the widest possible view of the sky. So with that said, you know, putting a plant there on the shelf, that's not the widest possible view of the sky. The widest possible view of the sky would be right here next to my window where the plant can literally see, has a view of the sky. Um, so for every two feet you move away from the window indoors, your light decreases by a, a square of that number. So if you move two feet away from the window, your light decreases by one fourth. If you move four feet, feet away from the window, your light decreases by one sixteenth. So you're drastically decreasing the light just by putting your plant inside your home further and further. So always try to give your plant the widest possible view of the sky. Um, and you know, if you are gonna put your plant like in the interior of a home, you really need to use grow lights as supplemental lighting. And of course, there's a broad range of light of what plants need. So here's a little diagram of what that looks like. So indoors, your west or your south facing light, that's like the strong afternoon sun, that's considered higher light. Um, as you move into, you know, the room, you have more medium light or what's sometimes called bright indirect light. And then at the back of the room, you have kind of lower light. And so at the bottom of this, you can see I've put the actual foot candles for lighting that the plants will tolerate for, you know, in order to survive. So your lowest light plants, you have about, they need a minimum of 200 foot candles. And you can measure the light using a light meter or like an app on your phone. But these are the plants that everyone knows as kind of like the tried and true low light tolerant plants, the ZZ plants, the snake plants, Dracaenas, Peperomias, Aspidistras, the peace lilies, right? These all work in indoors and they tend to survive for a long time. And then 400 foot candles, those are gonna be the bulk of your indoor plants, need a minimum of 400 foot candles. So things like the elephant ear plants, begonias, monsteras, philodendrons. Um, would the 200 foot candle plants prefer to be in 400 foot candles? Absolutely. Plants don't wanna be in low light if they had a choice. They would rather be in that medium light category, but the lower light plants we put there because they're tolerant of lower light. And then you have your high light, your 800 foot candle plants or higher, um, the bird of paradise, your ficus plants, succulents, yuccas, things like that. So this is kind of what that roughly looks like in a real life example. You have your succulents and cacti right on the window ledge. Right behind those are the ficus plants. And then behind those, you have dracaenas, philodendrons. In the back, you have some pothos, agleonemas. I'd probably move that spider plant up closer. Maybe you could pull the ZZ plant, but that's roughly what it's, what it's gonna look like. And you can see they're all pretty close to the window still. Um, just you know, a couple feet away is gonna make a big difference in terms of the lighting. So this is you know, a guideline on how long your plant can go without light because it really is, you know, the light is the food source for the plant. So essentially, if your plant is not receiving light, it's not producing food. Um, and you know, sometimes people say you're starving your plant, but plants can also you know, use, utilize their reserve of stored food. And that's, you know, when they're at the greenhouse, they're in optimal light and they're storing up food and energy that they're gonna use to grow. So sometimes people say, well, I bought a cactus and it's doing perfectly fine in, you know, in my office with no windows. And, you know, yes, it can exist for probably months, maybe even years without light, but it's using all of its stored energy and food and eventually it will run out and it will collapse. So, you know, it's about two weeks before it really starts to affect the plant and show visual signs of needing more light. Uh, but plants can also get too much light. Um, it doesn't happen as often as it could outside, but if you, you know, purchase a plant from, let's say, Ikea or Home Depot, you know, those plants have been in fluorescent lighting probably. Um, and then when you take them home, even if it says it's a highlight plant, 
you know, like this ficus lorata, it might actually get a sunburn if you just put it in full sun right away. So it's always recommended to kind of ease the plant into the light over a period of like two weeks, you know, every day introduce it to a little more sun and then that'll kind of acclimate the plant cells to, to be able to take in more light. These are some recommendations for higher light plants. This would be, you know, 600, 800, 1,000, 2,000 foot candle plants. And then the low light tolerant plants, again, they would prefer to be more medium light, but they can probably go down to the 200, 300 foot candles and be able to exist okay. And it's some examples of what plants look like when they're really struggling with lack of light. So the space between the leaves gets further and further apart and also the leaf size gets smaller and smaller. You can see this kind of elongated plant succulent stretching for that fluorescent lighting <laughs> as much as it can get. Um, color starts to fade when plants don't get enough light. You might see some yellowing. Yellowing can mean a lot of different things on plants, but it, one possible thing is lack of light. Um, so that is basically lighting. I would say if you take away anything from that, just give your plant the widest possible view of the sky. You know, after this lecture, everyone goes and puts their plant no more than like two feet away from the window. <laughs> And then watering. So, you know, watering is a function of light and temperature, um, but the light has to be solid. You know, no matter how much you adjust your lighting or your watering, it's never going to work exactly if you don't have the foundation of the light first. So just keep that in mind. But with that said, you can, you, you will need to adjust your watering based on light and temperature. And of course, seasonally too, right? So in the spring and the summer, when the plants are actively growing, they need more water. And then in the fall and the winter, when plants go through a little bit of a dormancy, even indoors, they usually utilize less water. Um, it's always preferred to have a drain hole in your pot. If you don't have a drain hole, you really have to get to know exactly how much you need to water so the water doesn't build up in the pot. And it's roughly 20% of the soil volume. Um, you know, if plants are overwatered, what happens is the roots start to rot essentially and develop a fungus or a bacteria. And, um, you know, plants start to decline pretty fast after that. So, and, and overwatering is always the most common thing with plants, I would say. So, um, you know, you can really prevent that by having a hole in the bottom of the pot and also giving your plant adequate light. And I don't know if any of you have used these before, but I really like soil probes. Um, it allows you to not only make holes in the soil, which will help with water and airflow, but it also allows you to test the soil at different depths, which is really helpful if you have a large tree and you don't you want to figure out how you know how wet is the soil down there. So the soil probes are roughly like a foot long. You kind of put them in, turn them, pull them out, and they have these different kind of notches in them. And you can see the soil samples at different depths. You know, usually it's darker when it's moist, it's lighter color when it's dry. You can like take all the samples, kind of rub them together in your hand. And if they stick together, then it's moist. You don't need to water. So really helpful. Um, you could also use a pen or a chopstick if you don't have a soil probe. Some examples of over and under watering, which can overlap, you know, yellowing could be either one, browning could be either one, um, and also wilting could be either one. So before, you know, let's say you look at a plant and it's got a lot of yellowing or browning leaves, or it might be kind of droopy. I would say the first thing I would check would be the soil and how moist it is. Is it really wet? Is it like bone dry? And that will usually tell you, you know, kind of how to proceed from there. Mm -hmm. These are some examples of overwatering. So you get this um, on the Stracina, this browning followed by the yellow line that is a fungus on the plant. Um, and it's really common to see this kind of brown with yellowing 
um, as a sign of overwatering. And it could also mean that it's not enough light, right? Because it's linked to how fast the plant processes the water. Um, this is a ficus audrey. So ficus can be a little temperamental with over underwatering. That's why you want to make sure you have the proper light as the basis for that. Um, but this soft, dark browning with kind of splotches in the leaves, you can see on this ficus lorata is a little, kind of similar. That's again, overwatering, probably, you know, possibly from not enough light as well. And then succulents, you kind of get this mushy yellow bottom stems or the cacti will usually start to rot from the base up. And then on the opposite end, you have some signs of underwatering. So you can see it's a different type of browning on this ficus lorata. It's not the soft black dark brown, it's this crispy browning. And it's usually around the edges of the leaves um, sometimes when people water, they don't get the entire root ball moist. They just focus the water in one area and that's going to, you know, cause minerals to build up. It's also going to make it so not all the roots are getting moisture. Um, so you really want to thoroughly water your plants when you're watering them, you know, really flush out any of the salts or minerals, get the whole root ball saturated wet. You do want water to come all the way out into the bottom of the pot. Um, and, you know, like I said, it's roughly 20% of the soil volume. Um, sometimes you can see curling on the leaves or droopiness. That can be a sign of underwatering. Um, you know, this peace lily, I'm sure we've all experienced this where all the leaves collapse and then you water it and it perks back up. Uh, succulent plants, you kind of get this kind of raisin pruning um, effect when the plant needs more moisture. All right, humidity. So humidity has a big effect on plants. And I don't know if you all have noticed maybe plants in your own home, if you have plants in your kitchen or your bathroom, I would bet that those plants probably look better than the plants in the other areas of your home in terms of the tips of the leaves, how nice, you know, and and full they are, because the more humidity you have in your home, the less your plants lose, the, the slower your plants lose moisture. Um, it helps new leaves unfurl, it keeps pests away. So there's just so many benefits to having a high humidity. Um, you can see, you know, a lot of indoor plant collectors, what they'll do is they'll have a humidifier in the room and also a fan. <laughs> so they have the air circulation, but they also have the high humidity. And most, you know, I, the proper levels, I would say, is like 60 to 80 percent, which is very high for plants. Um, but you really, it's like, a, you know, you just have to see how your plants are doing. I personally try to keep my plants that are a little more sensitive to underwatering. Um, or plants that, you know, need a lot of humidity in order to maintain healthy leaves. I keep those in the bathroom or the kitchen. So my begonias, um, my like cissus plants, like grape ivy, things, you know, my ferns, things like that. Um, if you don't have a humidifier at home, you can use um, a mister, you can put your plant on a tray of pebbles, my mom puts little jars of water next to all of her plants. Um, or you can just, you know, if you if you don't want to raise the humidity level in your home, you can just be okay with knowing that your plant will get some brown tips <laughs> at the ends of the leaves. And it's perfectly fine too. It usually it usually shows up as like an upside down V on the leaf. That's, you know, that's for low humidity. Um, I want to spend some time going over some different plant families just to give a rough, um, you know, idea about the care for them. So the Dracaena family, native to Africa, Asia, and Australia, there's so many different species. Actually, the snake plant, which used to be a Sansevieria, is now in the Dracaena family. Um, so there's over 100 different species. These plants are low light tolerant, so they can handle like the 200 foot candles. They would prefer to have more, more like 400, but they're tolerant of the 200. And they like to dry out between waterings. They really want to get, you know, dry, I would say 50% down 
um, between waterings. And most Dracaenas are also really good air purifiers. So they're good to have in a home. The fern family, there's so many different types of ferns, right? And they, they're, you know, they really range. Um, but I would say if you're, if you are wanting a fern or looking to design with ferns, ferns with larger leaves are going to be able to hold more moisture and won't dry out as fast as say, like a maidenhair fern with like a small leaf. Um, ferns generally like very high humidity, so you know 60 to 80 percent. You want to keep the soil constantly moist, um, and I would aim for a minimum of 400 foot candles with ferns, maybe even 600, um, because you know in the wild it, when they're in the forest they do have a view of the sky, so they do need bright light. Um, but the most important thing with these is really keep them, you know, well watered because if ferns dry out, unfortunately, you kind of lose all the leaves at one time instead of just one leaf at a time. And then the broad classification of the aeroid plants, um, these are native, most of them are native to forest floor kind of understory plants. These want a minimum of 400 foot candles. Um, and they like to dry out between watering. So like 25% down um, should be dry. Most, or not most, but all aeroids are toxic. So if you ever find that you have a plant that's an aeroid and you would know it because it produces this kind of inflorescence type flower, right? So this Pisali, this Anthurium, this Monstera, Diffenbachias, Aglionemas, elephant ears, they all produce the same type of flower, um, this inflorescence. And so those are all aeroids and they're all going to be toxic. Um, so if you do have pets or young kids, just make sure to put them in an area where they can't be reached. The ficus family, I really, I always recommend ficus for higher light environments. So a minimum of 800 foot candles. Um, because again, they're finicky with watering. So if you have the proper light, then you don't have to worry as much that they're going to get overwatered. Um, the ficus, um, the nice thing about these is they propagate really easily from stem cuttings. So you can continuously make new plants if you want. Um, but they also, if you break the leaf or stem, it does produce a white sap. That's a form of latex and it can be an irritant. So if you, you know, were ever to break a leaf, just make sure to wash your hands after that. But they're great plants, great for higher light, um, fairly low maintenance. And then the desert plants, so the cacti and the succulents. Um, so I would say with these, because we live in Seattle, we, you know, we are challenged with the light. Um, and I had the president of the Washington State Cacti and Succulent Society do a lecture at Glasswing. And she was, she said she moved here from Texas. And within the first two weeks, she killed her jade plant. And it's because she was used to watering it weekly in Texas because it was so dry and the light was so high. But in Seattle, the light is, you know, mini minimal compared to Texas and also very humid compared to Texas. So she overwatered it and it rotted within two weeks. So I would just say, you know, really pay attention to your light. Make sure you have south or west facing windows with succulents and water them according to the season. So this is some signs of underwatering. Again, you have the shriveled leaves, you have the rotting from the base with the cacti. Um, this aloe plant is underwatered. You can see the leaves are starting to kind of fold in on themselves and then the tips are turning brown. Same with this Haworthia. So those are underwatering, whereas the overwatering, you get the mushy leaves, yellowing leaves at the base. Um, and sometimes succulents can get too much sun, even though they are desert plants. If the light gets really intense in the summertime, which it sometimes does, um, you can kind of get this reddish, brownish hue on the plants. And that's a sign of stress for the plants. Um, sometimes it looks great on the plant and sometimes it doesn't. So you just kind of have to, you know, determine which, you know, maybe you need to pull the plant away from the window by a foot or so if it does seem stressed out or, you know, it might need a little more water as well. Okay, carnivorous plants. Um, 
I won't talk about too much except to say they are native to bog areas. Um, South Carolina is where a lot of garden centers get carnivorous plants and they're purely potted in peat moss um from peat bogs so potting it in regular potting soil might might actually kill the plant um they they like full sun so you know right in the window where they get direct sunlight and they want to be constantly moist um, preferably with filtered or distilled water or rain water so you can just let your water you know fill up a water pitcher let it sit out for a day or two and then you can use that to water the plant because room temperature water is always the best as well. Uh, but yeah, you don't really have to feed these. They're good at catching any bugs on their own. They're, they're pretty fun to have. Um, orchid plants, these are potted in either a fir bark or a sphagnum moss. Um, they need a lot of air around their roots. They, they like a lot of ventilation and they also want, you know, a little bit of direct sun is beneficial that's gonna um but not too much so i if you have a south or a west facing window just move them away by like two feet but if you have an eastern window put them like right in the window um and most orchid growers that i've talked to swear by watering every 10 to 14 days so give your plant like a thorough soaking um, and then wait until the bark or the moss is dry um, and then soak them again. And that's roughly every 10, you know, 10 days to 14 days. Air plants, these are part of the bromeliad family, you know, related to pineapples. So um, all bromeliads will flower once in their life, but after they're done flowering, they will produce a little, you know, offshoot called a pup. And those new plants would then flower on their own. So air plants, um, are native to, you can find them in like South America, in Texas, in Florida. They live on the undersides of trees. They use their roots to anchor themselves to the tree. And then they absorb all of their water and nutrients through their leaves. So in, um, to take care of these indoors, you wanna submerge them underwater about every two weeks, shake them out, let them dry, um, and then they need bright indirect light. So again, that would be like Eastern window, right in the window, or if you have a South or a West facing window, move it away like by two feet or so. And you can also mist the air plants in between soakings to make sure they're hydrated. Fertilizer, so fertilizing is usually done you know, during the active growing season, spring through fall, but it can be done all year round if your plant is growing. So, you know, some plants grow all year or grow it through the winter, in which case, yes, you would want to continue fertilizing them. Um, and, you know, all fertilizers will have three numbers on them, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, or the potassium. And, you know, it's a good way to remember up, down, and all around in terms of what those do for the plant. So the nitrogen, the up, supports the foliage and the stem growth, everything above the soil. The phosphorus, down, supports the root system. And then the potassium is the all around. It supports the cellular functions and it helps for the general hardiness and the resistance of the plant. So if the plant has the appropriate macronutrients and micronutrients, it's gonna be less susceptible to pests pests, plant pests. When plants get pests, they start to kind of signal, send these signals out that they need help, that they're stressed out. And unfortunately, plant pests pick up on those signals and are attracted to the plant. Um, so we'll talk about what some of those pests are and how to get rid of them too. Um, and then in terms of potting soil and repotting, it really is done, you know, when the plant needs more room to grow or when it's used up its soil in its pot. Because indoor plants, right, they are totally reliant on this little, little container of soil and what's in the soil in order to grow. So you really wanna make sure your soil is full of the appropriate nutrients. It's usually composed of some sort of peat. It could be cocoa peat or peat moss, usually a vermiculite. 
um, to, to help with the aeration and moisture control. And then it usually has a little bit of fur bark in it as well. And then you need the macro and the micronutrients um, from the fertilizers that you give it. Um, cactus or succulent soil and soil that palms are used or citrus plants use, um, that is usually a little bit rockier or grittier, maybe has some sand or some coarse, you know, small rocks in it to help with the drainage so the water flows through quicker. Um, and in, in terms of repotting, you generally want to go two inches bigger. So from a four inch pot, you go to a six inch. From a six inch pot, you go to an eight inch. And these are some signs of, you know, plants that need to get repotted. You can see sometimes you'll see the roots screwing out the bottom of the pot. You can, you know, if you pull a plant out and all you see are roots and no soil, you know, it definitely needs to get repotted. Sometimes you, you'll feel like you're watering the plants. Like, you know, I'm watering it like three times a week and it, it used to be once a week. It's probably because the roots have grown out to fill the pot. So generally just loosen up the roots a little bit, give it some fresh soil um, and give it a thorough watering once, once the plant has been potted. The exception to this are cacti and succulents. So cacti and succulents, um, the roots are more sensitive and they're fragile and they tend to break and tear easier. And it, they also take longer to grow new roots. Um, and to repair themselves. So when you repot a cacti or a succulent, you don't wanna loosen up the roots as much as you would for like a foliage plant. And you don't necessarily want to water directly after repotting. You want the roots to kind of repair themselves, which usually takes like a week or two, and then you can start to water. Propagation, I won't go into too much, I, just to say that most plants will propagate from stem or leaf cuttings. Um, so it's always fun to kind of figure out how that works. Um, so if you do have an indoor plant, you know, you could, you could always Google it. Like begonias, you know, I was fascinated when I found out that begonias will grow from, you know, just a stem cutting, just cut off a leaf and stick it in water and it will produce roots. So it's a really fun project and you can do it on most plants you can propagate. Um, bugs, I do wanna talk about <laughs> before we run out of time. So being a gardener, as you know, is dealing with bugs, right? There's growth and there's decay and you have to kind of be able to accept all of it and not be overwhelmed by it. So um, the most common indoor pests I find are thrips and they kind of look like these little black lines. They kind of scrape the plant. So you'll see like scrapings on the leaf, but they're so tiny. Um, so you really have to inspect the plant. The first thing you might notice is that the plant just overall doesn't seem as healthy as it should be. And then you can kind of inspect the leaves and see if you can see anything on the leaves. Do you see any like little marks that could be bugs? Do you see any, you know, splotching? on the leaf, um, a lot of times the bugs will leave behind a sticky kind of residue on the leaf. And whenever I feel stickiness on plant leaves, I know that there's some sort of bug, even if you can't see them, they're, they're there. And the stickiness on the leaves, the honeydew essentially is what attracts ants to the plant. So if you ever find that you have an ant problem on your indoor plants, it's probably that because you have another pest on it. Um, mealy bug is super common on indoor plants. It looks like white cotton fluff, like tiny, tiny little bits of white cotton fluff. The nice thing about mealy bug is they come off very easily. You can just wipe them off with a Q-tip dipped in rubbing alcohol. You can use neem oil, just rub them all off um, and then treat the plant with some sort of insecticidal soap. Scale is a little more challenging to get off. You really kind of have to scrape at it. So if you have an area or a leaf that's really infested, just cut the entire leaf off. Um, the Amazon domes, they have like a huge ficus inside their domes. They had a bad mealybug problem on it and they actually just removed one of the major limbs of the tree because it was so infested and they knew that they just would not be able to con you know continue to treat it and stay on top of it and it was easier just to cut the plants you know 
by a quarter than having to deal with this bug infestation. So the first thing you always want to do is remove the bugs that you can see, whether you're cutting the plant uh, you know, down or whether you're scraping the bugs off. And then once you remove the, the pests, treat it with some sort of insecticidal soap or oil. I, you can use neem oil, you can use you know, rosemary oil. Um, there's a lot of solutions out there that are kind of more natural and safe. Um, and then you have to just stay on top of it. You know, do weekly checks on your plant. If you find more bugs, remove them, do it again. But eventually you will get to a point where maybe you're just doing monthly checks or every you know, quarterly checks on your plant and you just see a little bug here and there and you're able to kind of stay on top of it and treat it. Spider mites um, are really tough. You know, usually if you see spider mites, you know, the webbing around the entire plant or an entire leaf, I would probably just dispose of the plant. They're really common on things like English ivy um, or on alocasia plants. Um, and aphids, if you ever try to grow indoor, you know, edibles, any herbs indoors, tomatoes, um, eggplant, basically any type of edible plant indoors, you will 100% get aphids. <laughs> and they, you know, it's the same thing where you just want to remove them all, spray it down, continue to check it, and definitely use, you know, an organic, you know, solution like neem to treat it. Fungus gnats are so common on indoor plants too, and they aren't so much of an issue for the actual plant as the other bugs are, um, but they are annoying and um, they do spread from plant to plant very quickly. So if you do notice those little flying gnats around the soil or like let's say you water or move the soil and they kind of fly out of the soil, I would treat it if you see you know, a lot of them. One or two here and there is not a big deal, but if you start to see a lot of fungus gnats, um, then you can use ne beneficial nematodes to get rid of them. Um, you can let the soil dry out to make sure you don't have any dead or dying foliage around the soil line. Um, you can use mosquito bits those work great and you just kind of sprinkle it on the soil and they kill off all the fung fungus gnat larvae. And then there's things like fungal infections, powdery mildew. So it's really important to have good air circulation around plants. And also if you do notice any sort of mildew or mold or fungus on the leaves, avoid water spreading it. So don't water overhead, just water on the soil. Don't mist your plant because the water droplets will spread the fungus. Um, and then prune off anything that's really bad. So I just have some resources. We talked about the Houseplant Journal. Homestead Brooklyn is a woman in Brooklyn who actually lived across from my shop. She has a full educational series that she offers um, online. Um, she's a scientist and she's, I would say she's, she's more of an expert on like fungal infections, bacteria, um, plant pests. Um, and integrated pest management she knows a lot about. Um, so she's a good person to check out. Houseplants 401 is just great if you need a quick reference on how to care for a plant and also trouble signs of plants. So I use this you know, a lot if someone's like, oh, I've got a Mingarelia, it's dropping leaves, I feel like the sun and the water are right, what could it be? And so you could just you know, look up the plant and then it'll have some like the general care and then the trouble signs and what those could be. Um, and then of course the UW Botanic Gardens, um, the Volunteer Park Conservatory, Bellevue Botanic Gardens, and then you know, I'm always available to answer questions on indoor plants as well. Um, but I'd be happy to take questions now as well, if anyone has questions on their indoor plants or anything else plant related. I have a question. Sure. Um, I have a sun porch and um, I have my, it's got big windows and I have my plants right by the windows, but the city installed a big light and so the plants on this sun porch are never in total darkness. Oh, okay. Are, are they, is that okay? 
It's not ideal, but the light is probably, I, I don't know how strong the light is. I guess, I suppose you could measure it. Um, if it's under 200 foot candles, it's probably fine. Um, you know, you just don't want a bright light on the plant, you know, 24 hours a day. But if it's, if, if it's not super strong at night, it's probably okay. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, you, uh, if I understood correctly, you mentioned um, edible plants are usually aphids are attracted by yeah. edible plants. And my question is, I have read somewhere that calendula would be a good victim plant to lure away the aphids and to plant in between edible plants. And I'm asking because edible plants is what I would like to put in our demo beds in ocean shores this year. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering about that. It's totally different outdoors than indoors because okay. outdoors you have your natural predators, you that. have your ladybugs, you have your praying mantises, so many lace wings, so many different things that will eat the aphids and they should eat the aphids. You should, you should let the aphids be on those plants so the other plants can benefit and, and have a food source. So I wouldn't worry about it outdoors, but yes, it's always good to, to think about the companion plantings, planting calendula, planting marigolds, I have my different hand. things like that. I'm okay, thank something. you. Yeah. So just as well indoors, right? It's okay, just indoors you. that it's really an issue. Hey, what's happening? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, I have a question about setting your plants in the window, mm -hmm. like a south face window. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever worry about the glass intensifying um, the light and being too much that, you know, in, in yes. regards to inside by the, through a window or outside in the same sun? Yeah, it definitely can make a difference. And that's why I would recommend measuring the light because there's certain times, you know, I've, you know, customers have come back and they, and they've said, oh, my plant got a sunburn, right? <laughs> From the glass. Um, and it, it can definitely happen. And so it just really depends on how intense the light is, you know, most highlight plants that want to be in the south or the west facing window should be in light, you know, 800 to 2000 foot candles. But if you have a, you know, a certain time of the year or time of the day where that light is really intense, you maybe want to put a filter over the curtain to block it a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions, comments for Tassie. I'm curious about transplanting Christmas cactus because, you know, usually they say leave them alone, but at what point do you sort of decide you've left them alone long enough in them? <laughs> yeah, I would say think about the soil quality, right? So if they're happy and they're actively growing and continuing to flower and you feel like you are managing the water okay, then you don't necessarily have to repot them. But if you feel like you're watering them, you know, multiple times a week, or if you feel like maybe they haven't grown, um, but they have adequate light, then, then it could be, you know, you could assess the soil because over time, all soil will kind of need to be replaced. Um, it gets kind of, you know, crusty and hard and it just loses its nutrients over time. Um, and so you will need to amend it, you know, I would say at least every four years. If I'm going to do that, and you were talking about the don't water them right away, would it's I like, water no. it? No, the Christmas cactus, out. I would treat the Christmas cactus more like a foliage plant, not a, a cacti succulent. And so I would water it right away. And I would use more of a regular, you know, potting soil mix versus a succulent mix. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Jude, you have your hand up. Can you turn your sound on the mic? The uh, you suggest putting your plants that are moisture loving in your bathroom. I have yet to live in a house with a bathroom that had much light in it. Yeah. What light are you suggesting? What light sources are you suggesting to be used with them? If you put it in the bathroom, uh -huh. um, you can use grow lights. So any all spectrum light would work. Another thing you can do, <laughs> it's a little bit of a hassle, but you could bring, if it's a small plant, like a fern, 
you could bring it in your bathroom when you take a shower um, or you can, you know, most kitchens have windows. And like I said, plants thrive in any room with natural environment because you have like your pots of boiling water on the stove and you're washing your dishes and the dishwasher. So there's a lot of natural humidity in the kitchen. Um, so you could consider that versus the bathroom. But yeah, bathroom plants, they, they do well. Um, but you do need to have the minimal amount of light, which is, you know, roughly two to 400 foot candles. Okay. So grow light is a brand, right? No, grow light is a, a type of light, you know, um, it's a bowl. It's, you could get it as a regular bulb and just stick it into a lamp. And you just want to make sure, you know, there's different types of grow lights. So I would just say an all spectrum grow light is good. And it doesn't matter too much. I mean, there's not that much variation, I don't think. I mean, there's the rev grow lights, which are more focused on flowering production. Um, whereas if you just have the general white grow light, that's usually like kind of the all spectrum one. Thank you. Yeah, but if you haven't tried grow lights before and you do have darker areas in your home where you want plants, they really do make a big difference. The plants are much happier. Essie, I'm curious about the overall experience about, you know, in, in, in Brooklyn, you were in Manhattan in a very urban environment, right? And mm -hmm. now coming out to Seattle. And of course, you have different weather conditions, right? And, you know, in yeah. the Northeast, right, you're gonna have a much colder winter and so forth, and yeah. you have a hot, humid summer and so forth. But I'm just curious about the, the urban experience of indoor, you know, plant life. Are you finding it any different in terms of the consultations you, you provided then versus here? And the types of plants and the types of problems that people had in, in, in a very urban environment versus where they're at here in a more casual urban, shall we say? Yeah, um, the, the main difference I would say is that the, the light and the temperature. So everyone in New York has like radiant, you know, like radiant heating. So in the winter time, it's actually warmer in your apartment than it is the rest of the year because the radiators are all cranked up to like, you know, 70, 80 degrees. The landlords just crank up the heat. And so you're actually watering your plants more often in the winter than you are spring and summer. So that's kind of a big difference. And also the air is very dry. Like you have to have a humidifier or like be misting your plants every day. Um, I was kind of blown away when I first like noticed the humidity here. And when I saw air plants here, I was like, oh, the air plants are so happy here because they were just absorbing the moisture from the air. Whereas in New York, they always looked a bit dry, <laughs> like always dry. We can never get them kind of hydrated enough. But the, the types of plants are similar because, you know, most garden centers get their plants from the same places. You have, you know, Florida, for your aeroid plants. Um, and then you have California for, you know, a lot of the cacti succulent growers and everyone is getting them from the same places. So there is a lot of overlap in terms of the plant varieties and the plant pricing is also pretty similar. There's, of course, there's gonna be a huge difference in outdoor plants. Um, you know, the, the West Coast has so many more options for outdoor plants and the prices, I would say, are half the price of what they are on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, and you just have so many, it's just pretty limited. Um, there's a couple of great growers that I work with because we do have an outdoor space in the New York shop. But yeah, it's nothing, it's nothing like the, the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Jude, you want to, you have I, your hand. I do, I, I do. I am so impressed by your practical knowledge uh, that uh, I've got to ask you a very practical question. Okay. I have uh, two very, very large uh, euphorbia with lots and lots of thorns on them mm. and sap that is extremely caustic and both yeah. of them are going to be destroyed or they have to be repotted. Mm. So do you have any tricks uh, that I might be able to use. They're, they're very big. They're almost as big as I am. To repotting, for mm -hmm. repotting. Mm -hmm. um, for cacti, you know, I like to lay them down on mm -hmm. their sides. Um, and then it's definitely a two, two to three person job. Um, so lay them down, get them out of their existing pot. 
And then your new pot, you know, prep it, put in a little soil, lay it down, and then kind of gently work the root base into it and then kind of push it back up. And I would wear probably like gloves that you would use for roses, right? Like really- Or, or worse. Yeah, or worse. <laughs> so really like thick um, work gloves. And then also I would use, you know, probably some sort of newspaper or paper to, or bubble wrap I've used before, bubble wrap to hold the cacti. Um, in place. So have one person hold it while the other person is potting it. But you definitely need to, to lean it down because you're not going to be able to pull it and stick it into the big pot if it's a big plant. True. Yeah. True. You wouldn't like to have these two, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I unfortunately <laughs> don't. I, I am not blessed with light in my home. So I am all about the, the low light tolerant plants. <laughs> By the way, I want to do a shout out for Tassie for your first book, that Rooted in Design book. I mean, the oh, uh, the uh, the shout out is that the is to, for the concepts of the plant mountings on the wall. I mean, mm -hmm. you've created plant experiences there that truly make you know that just their their artwork really it, uh, to adorn your home. Just beautiful, beautiful concepts. Yeah, I think the idea of having plants in your home, you know, I think can definitely be artwork, especially if you are just working with certain specimens that have like a really, you know, like interesting stem shape or something like, you know, like this, where you're just, where you can really appreciate them for what they are. You know, I think, I mean, I do love, of course, the, the standard, you know, snake plants, the spider plants that just fill out a space that are easy to care for. Um, but I also, you know, really appreciate the unusual leaves and different ways to display plants. And I think so many people, you know, in New York, so many people were limited on floor space that you had to really think about, you know, how can you hang plants or how can you, you know, put it on a wall? <laughs> it does make them, I will say it does make the maintenance challenging, <laughs> having to remove it and water it, let it dry and then put it back up. But um, it is really rewarding, I think, if you're using it as an art piece or a focal piece. Other questions for Tassie? I, I have just want to comment that um, I really appreciate your presentation and I've learned a lot and it makes me feel a lot better because I was just, I had just given up. Like <laughs> I have I have lots of outdoor plants and, and yeah. I don't have any problem growing them at all, but yeah all the indoor plants I buy, they just die. They just mm -hmm. die on me and I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong. But now I know it's, it's light. It's, it's all about the light. light. It really I, is. I have them like set back a couple of feet from the window, for yeah. instance, and, and kind of maybe off to the side. So it's not directly coming in. And I think, oh, that's plenty of light. That should be plenty of light, yes. you know, but they just slowly die until, yes. and I can't save them. And then I bought a grow light and it's red. And, which is um, fine but it focuses more the red is more for the the flowering and fruiting yeah well by the I think by the time I put the grow light on most of them they were already on their yeah. last leg and they weren't going to survive so but now I know I, I think I just can't have indoor plants unless I can figure out a way to get them closer to the window yes and mm. houseplant journal like I said if you if you have time to look at some of these resources they really are informative and you know give kind of you know, Houseplant Journal has a chart of lighting and what plants will will exist in, what, you know, to, you know, sustain themselves and what they will, you know, thrive in. So you can kind of see, you know, where your light is and what plants you can, what, what plants you can use. Yeah, great idea. Thank you. Yeah. And this, of course, underscores the reason that um, uh, why Tassie's presentation this morning is so important for us is that we do spend a lot of time talking about outdoor horticulture. And it, um, and we we don't spend much time at all in our education or in it, uh, with our or with our clients, right? Talking about um, what is how to be successful with indoor plants. Mm -hmm. So this is. I why have this a is... question, Kelly. Yeah, Karen, please. Um, is there some way that we can uh, that you can send us a copy of this um, list of resources that we could maybe have in our plant clinic boxes so that we could help people. We don't get a lot, but we do sometimes get people that have indoor plant questions. Oh, yeah. We do. really don't know. I don't know very much about them yeah. to help. 
Well, I I do have a copy of Tassie's presentation. Tassie, would it be okay if I shared this with the group? Yeah, definitely. And the UW Botanic Gardens, I mean, they have a resource where people, where horticulturalists will just answer any questions. Um, they come in, I think, on a weekly basis to do it. And you can even, I don't know if they're doing it now where you could bring in your plant, maybe not because of COVID, but you used to be able to bring in your plant if you had a question on it and they would like get out the microscope and tell you what was wrong, you know, what type of plant it was and what could possibly be wrong with it. But I know that they are, um, I'm pretty sure they still do it, you know, via email right now. So they're, they're always a great resource for plant questions. Connie, you have your hand up. Um, yes, what, how would I get something to measure the light intensity? Yeah, let me see. Um, so the light meter that I use is called Dr. Meter. Um, you can get this on Amazon. Um, you can also, there's apps that you can get if you have, you know, a smartphone. I, I don't know of any apps, but I'm sure if you just looked up like light meter, you know, apps on your phone, you could find something. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions for Tassie? This has been incredibly helpful because it's just, a, it's, it's, it's interesting with as much experience as we all have with plants, right? You know, the indoor environment is such a foreign place for so many of us. I have a, a question about the plant you call a snake plant. Is that the same plant that some people call mother-in-law? It is, it is. And now it's, uh, it got reclassified a while back as a Dracaena. So it's in the Dracaena family now. But yes, the snake plant, I, I love it because like I said, I don't get a lot of light in my home. So I'm able to kind of put that in areas um, of lower light. Um, but, and they're, I, I really like them just because they're so vertical and low maintenance. They're, they're really one of the easiest plants there is. Thank you. Yeah. And Tassie, I also see that you seem to have a lot of clay pots behind you, right? So does that, uh, that contributes to more watering, I would think, correct? It does. It does because I have like, you know, with, with less light, you have the worry of overwatering. So I want my soil to dry out very quickly. Um, so I, I put most of my plants in clay pots. And by the way, a shout out if you're, if, if all of you noticing the backdrop, I mean, it really does make for a very artistic backdrop, <laughs> right? This whole shelf full of plants, right? You know, of, it becomes an interesting, in, an interesting um, um, eye catching uh, piece right there. I promise you, I give them all light, <laughs> even though they don't look like they have much light there. They, they do get the afternoon light. <laughs> Other questions for Tassie. This has been super, super fascinating. I still would like to make a comment. Um, Tassie, thank you so much for the information about how to turn the bathroom into a um, plant center. Because yes. I haven't had a bathroom in centuries that had a window. And yeah. now I'm going to replace my mirror lights with grow lights and put yeah. plants in there. And I'm totally inspired and motivated and excited. <laughs> and that's what that's really the highlight that I got out, out of your presentation, which was fantastic overall. But that's the gem for me. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. Your plants are going to love it. Trust oh, me. Yeah, me. They're going to thrive in there. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, thanks so much for visiting with us today. Again, I have a copy of your presentation, and it um, and you're available. Then you're you're uh, through the through the glass wing shop. Um, yes, yes, Edra? yeah, yeah. It's just Tassie T A S S Y at glasswingshop.com is my email. And I encourage you to check out their website, you know. And if you're up in the Seattle area, come visit, you know, because it uh, this is it really looks like a really interesting spot. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay. So going back to sharing with the, our work here and it uh, and kicking on here is that um, I want to thank um, Tassie and thank everybody for collaborating here. Uh, we're uh, we'll uh, finish we'll officially finish our our formal meeting here. And so I'm going to go ahead and um, and stop the recording, and we're going to kick off with our um, kick off with our board meeting.